Welcome to those of you joining online and to those people that are here in person at International House today. Um, there are just a couple of housekeeping points uh, relating to today's session. We will be recording the talk, as you've already been informed. Um, however, we won't be recording the Q&A session at the end. Um, the talk will then be available to access online on the IAS website um, and the YouTube channel. Um, and we'll let you know when that's available. Um, there will also be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the session. Uh, for those people watching online, um, there is a, a Q&A function um, that you can submit questions to. And um, you can post questions in the chat as well. And we will be monitoring that throughout the talk today. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Amal Hajaj to give the formal introduction to today's session. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. So it's, uh, it's our honor today to have um, uh, Dr. Nazik Adab here uh, at Loughborough. So Dr. Nazik is uh, an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at, and uh, in KAST, where I did my PhD. And um, also she's the PI of the Smart Advanced Numeric Devices and Application. Um, Dr. Al Atab, also our research interest, focuses on the design and fabrication of smart memories and electronics device and their application. And I'm pretty sure that today during the you know the seminar we'll learn more and more about this. So just a few uh, maybe words about uh, what uh, the you know the rewards that Dr. Al Atab she got during her uh, career. So uh, Nazik has been selected among the 2022, uh, 2020 UC Berkeley EC uh, Rising Stars and also the 10 innovators under 35 by MIT Technology Review Arabia uh, 2020, uh, 2020. And uh, also her research was highlighted by you know, um, many of uh, the high impact factor and also the prestigious donor and institute like the IEEE Spectrum and the National Geographic BBC, MIT and Technologies and more and more. So, we are really happy to have you here, Nasik, and we are really, you know, um, looking forward to uh, to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Anna, for the kind introduction, and so thank you to Laura. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in the world uh, for the first time at Tufts University and also at UK in UK. Um, so today I'll be giving a talk on uh, which is entitled "Topology and Functionality Transform Electronics for IoT Applications." Uh, in my talk, I will uh, have the first part, which is going to be focused on memory applications that we are focusing on, in specific smart memory devices, which can sense and compute and not just store data. Uh, the second part of my talk will be focused more on uh, 3D and 4D printing of fle or flexible and stretchable electronics. Um, and I, I think I have one slide where I would like to mention also some of my uh, previous postdoctoral uh, work. Uh, so let's start. Uh, first, I have one slide to give you an overview of my career progress so far. So I got my uh, uh, bachelor's degree in computer and communication engineering from the Kennedy University in uh, Lebanon in 2012. Then in 2017, I got my PhD from the Mazdar Institute of Science and Technology in Abu Dhabi under a cooperative program with MIT and uh, which was funded by the US Office of Naval Research. Um, during my PhD, I had the opportunity to work with Professor Krishna Saraswat as a visiting researcher at Stanford University as well. Uh, then in, uh, in October 2017, I joined CAFS as a postdoc with Professor Mohammed Hussein, who's currently at Purdue University. Um, and then uh, in, in 2020, I got promoted to a research scientist and more recently, around two years ago, in uh, June 2021, uh, I got hired uh, as an assistant professor at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Uh, my research uh, uh, so far has resulted in several awards, uh, in, for example, the Forming Science Fellowship by L'Oreal UNESCO, uh, International Rising Science Award by L'Oreal UNESCO, uh, being portrayed among the Remarkable Women in Technology by UNESCO, uh, the, uh, being selected among the ECS Rising Stars uh, at UC Berkeley, uh, in, in addition to being selected among the Innovators Under 35 uh, by MIT Technology Review Arabia. Uh, I'm also a, a, an IEEE Electron Device Society Distinguished lecturer and a neon uh, change maker. So let's start with the uh, first with the motivation behind our work, in, uh, in specific uh, related to the memory uh, work. Uh, so currently, we are constantly moving towards a more and more digitized world where interconnected smart devices interact with the physical world and communicate seamlessly over the internet. And this digital transformation is taking place thanks to several exciting technologies, such as the Internet of Things, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, among uh, you know others, which are bringing numerous benefits to our lives through our different fields, uh, from transportation to healthcare, agriculture, among others. Now, if we take a closer look at any of these uh, smart devices, we can see that they include several key components. 
for example, if we take the example of a smartwatch, an Apple watch, for example, and you try to disassemble it, you can see that it includes several uh, key components, uh, such as the communication unit, sensors, uh, processor, memory, and the power unit. And you can see that as we, uh, you know, uh, improve and, and provide uh, you know, advanced versions of the Apple Watch, so Apple Watch version six, we were able to introduce additional sensors, uh, you know, more powerful sensors, better communication, all of which require, uh, you know, uh, faster and uh, higher capacity memory devices. So really, the progress or the the uh, the, the uh, advances in, in memory devices has been a key technology enabler. Now, uh, futuristic applications have specific requirements on memory devices. They have to be fast and reliable. They have to be of high density, low cost, and low power. But what is the current state of the art uh, in, in memory devices? If we look at this chart, we can see that memory devices can be divided into two main categories, non-volatile and volatile, where volatility means that the data would be lost if the power is turned off. And if you look at the non-volatile memory, for example, the NAND flash, which is currently being used in more than 99% of the applications, according to the International Roadmap of Devices and Systems, we can see that it, it actually uh, comes at a low cost, but it provides a slow access time. On the other hand, the DRAM, which is volatile, it has a much faster access time, but at a more expensive cost. Now, futuristic applications really require uh, being able to combine between both benefits. So we want really lower cost and, and faster access time. And if you think about, uh, for example, the, the application in AI or autonomous cars, where really the processor needs to, the, to access the data stored in the memory in real time to analyze the data and make a decision to whether maybe, uh, you know, turn left or right. Uh, so we really need to make decisions uh, in, in almost real time to, right, to avoid any catastrophe. And so the, the access time of the memory really needs to be uh, as quick as possible. And so to overcome uh, this limitation, researchers have been working on developing uh, you know, new memory technologies which operate using different uh, operation mechanisms such as magnetic RAM, uh, ferroetic RAM, phase change RAM, and resistive RAM. And while these technologies were able to show faster and lower power operation compared to flash memory, uh, however, they still have several bottlenecks that they need to overcome, such as showing lower density, some, uh, you know, use some uh, exotic materials. They are uh, not CMOS compatible. They show some reliability concerns or being expensive. And therefore, the major requirements for future memory devices remain being able to combine between non-volatility, high speed, high density, low power, and low cost. Now, again, if we look at this chart that I mentioned, uh, we said that the land flash flash is already being used in more than 99% of the applications. And the way we were able to uh, traditionally improve uh, the speed of these devices is by scaling them down, okay? So by scaling them down, we're able to improve the access time. However, this solution cannot be pursued indefinitely due to physics, uh, physics uh, limitations. Uh, and therefore, uh, currently researchers are exploring uh, other alternatives to achieve faster and more real-time data access without to really have to scale down uh, the device. And these approaches are based on in-memory computing, uh, where the memory and processor are both closer to each other as much as possible, or even merged together in a single device, which can perform both uh, tasks at the same time. So these uh, scenarios, the, their main goal is to minimize data movement as much as possible, right? Data has to move usually between processor and memory, which causes delays. And therefore, if we are trying, if we can do uh, and develop smart memory devices which can compute in situ, then minimize the data movement as much as possible and therefore contribute to faster and more real time data analysis. To explain this concept a bit uh, further, uh, assume we have an IoT system. Uh, you know, in general, IoT systems include sensors, an analog digital converter, because the data which is obtained from sensors is, is usually analog while uh, the memory and processors uh, deal with dig digital data. And so you need this ADC unit, which is time and energy consuming. Uh, and then uh, the data will be sent to the memory and processor among other components. So the in-memory computing approach is based on merging the memory and processor within a single device that is capable of both tasks at the same time. And this has shown uh, you know, to enable 10,000 times faster operations it's already a key technology enabler uh, for AI and machine learning. It has been adopted by Google, Facebook, you know, IBM, several companies, and it has a projected market of $31 billion by 2026. However, this, uh, this technology is still in its infancy and there is still a lot of you know, improvements that can be made. 
Uh, in my group, what we're trying to do is we're trying to complement these efforts and try to minimize the data movement uh, as much as possible, uh, more and more. And so we're working on in-memory sensing. So what is in-memory sensing? Again, uh, if we consider the system, an IoT system, we said we said in-memory computing is based on having the memory and processor, uh, uh, you know, merge together uh, uh, to achieve, you know, uh, storage and processing at the same time. However, uh, data still has to go through the sensor, through this energy and time-consuming uh, ADC unit uh, to the memory, right? Uh, so this means there's still some delay uh, in this region. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to combine uh, between the sensor and memory and get rid of the ADC. So we're getting rid of the ADC unit and merging between the sensor and the memory in an in-memory sensing uh, device, okay? So this is a smart memory device that can sense. Uh, we call it a memsor, which is memory plus sensor. Uh, and for example, a pressure monster when exposed to a pressure stimulus would store the pressure intensity within it, while a light monster when exposed to a light intensity, uh, a light stimulus, would, start, would store the, the light intensity within it uh, directly. So this would allow for faster response since we are minimizing data movement as much as possible, ideally lower area or a lower footprint area because we're using the same a structure of the memory, but we're introducing uh, some, uh, you know, uh, stimulus sensitive materials within the same device. And so ideally we should achieve lower area and lower power consumption. Uh, so how we're doing that, as I said, we're integrating stimulus sensitive materials in uh, the, the existing memory devices to allow them to sense an external stimulus and store the data directly within it. Initially, we, we, we tried to, to focus on flash memory. Uh, the reason is, that, again, because it's already being used in more than 99% of the applications, it's a very mature technology. And so if we're able to show this new application in this mature technology, we could uh, potentially uh, you know, make the tech transfer uh, faster. Uh, to give an example of, uh, you know, in terms of numbers, a state-of-the-art imaging sensor has a response time of 10 nanoseconds, while the <laughs> takes uh, on average 40 microseconds while traditional memory flash memory takes around 240 microseconds to write the data within it. We're trying to uh, you know, uh, you know, replace all of these components in a single memory device, which uses the same structure as the traditional memory, but using uh, you know, uh, uh, stimulus sensitive materials in the active layers of the device. And we're trying to reach uh, in the nanoseconds range as a response time. And similar to a traditional flash memory, which can store multiple bits, right? Uh, uh, the the memsor could store also multiple bits, and the different states would be representing the different intensities of the uh, stimulus that is being sensed. And then the, the in-memory sensing uh, approach or technology can be combined with the in-memory processing as well to achieve in-memory sensing and processing uh, within the same the, the same uh, single device. So it's a smart multifunctional memory device. Uh, which would enable a, a you know more real-time data analysis, a more compact system. To develop such systems, we have to have a good knowledge of memory technologies, sensors, integration packaging techniques, and this is most uh, you know uh, promising in applications where data is being acquired by sensors, uh, such as autonomous cars, uh, IoT, or uh, augmented reality, among others. So now let's look into some uh, of our work uh, in this area. Um, so the first work uh, that I'm presenting here is based on a smart uh, memory device that can sense optical data. Uh, and it's based on a flash memory architecture. Now, a flash memory architecture uh, that has the same structure as a transistor, okay? The same structure as a MOSFET, but with an additional uh, layer within the gate oxide uh, to store the data. Uh, a simpler way to analyze a flash memory uh, using a simpler structure is the MOSCA, the capacitor structure, which is two terminal, uh, as it is easier to fabricate, but uh, it still allows us to understand, you know, and analyze the charge trapping capability of uh, such devices. So the fabrication is, is quite simple. On a silicon substrate, we first deposit uh, a, a few nanometers, three nanometer uh, aluminum oxide using the atomic layer deposition tool. This is used as the tunnel oxide. And then uh, we use molybdenum disulfide material as the uh, similar sensitive uh, material. So we chose MOS2 because it's one of the uh, you know, most mature uh, to the materials. Uh, it, is, uh, it has shown uh, excellent you know, performance in uh, optical uh, electronic devices in photodetectors. And, and therefore we wanted to explore the application in those uh, optical in-memory sensing devices. 
Now, the MOS2 layers that we have here, uh, they're not monolayers. We, we, they are solution processable. Uh, so we have flakes of these MOS2 in solution. And we explored both uh, approaches, uh, you know, job casting versus pin coating. Uh, so we really get, uh, you know, you can think of as an agglomeration of flakes in this case. And then on top of the flakes, we have another uh, aluminum oxide layer, again, thin film of seven nanometers. Uh, that was using the atomic layer deposition tool, uh, which acts in this case as a blocking oxide. And then on top, we have the uh, metal electrodes. And here you can see SEM images, scanning electron microscopy images of the spin coating versus drop casting uh, of the MOS2. Of course, the drop casting gets a much larger density of these flakes. Uh, now, how does this affect the performance of the memory? So first, we characterize the memory in terms of electrical performance before moving to the optical performance. Uh, in terms of electrical performance, we do the programming and erasing using CV measurements, capacitance versus voltage measurements. Uh, so we do sweeping in both directions, positive to negative and then negative to positive, and we see the memory window, the hysteresis. So the larger this memory window, the better, because you can distinguish better between the program and erase states, and also it allows you to store multiple bits. So as you can see with the drop casting, we get a much larger memory window compared to the spin coating which is expected as we have a large, larger density of these MOS2 uh, flakes, uh, which uh, include a much larger density of charge dropping uh, states. I would like to note here that this work uh, is prepared by, uh, is done by my postdoc, uh, Dr. Dainant Kumar, and the uh, PhD student, uh, Dr. Henry Lee. Okay, so here you can see some additional characterization of the device. So this is the SIMS profile of the device. Uh, you can see the MOS2 region is around 70 nanometer. So now the characterization that I'm doing is focused on the drop casted uh, device since it's showing a larger memory window. So you can see the MOS2 region is around 70 nanometers. Uh, we, we did the uh, electrical characterization in terms of programming and erasing at different operating voltages. Uh, you can see that, of course, as the program raised voltage is increased, uh, you are uh, giving the, uh, the charges uh, within the channel more energy. So they can tunnel through the tunnel oxide and get stored within the charge shopping states uh, in the MOS2 and on the interface. And uh, here you can see the memory window at different uh, operating voltages. So we're able to achieve almost six volts, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, memory window at uh, 10 minus 10 uh, operating voltage. <coughs> and uh, the, the uh, CV curves at different frequencies, the hysteresis here shows and confirms that there are charge shopping states at the interface uh, as well. Uh, then we did some more reliability testing. Uh, so here you can see the cycle to cycle uniformity within the same device. Uh, you can see that you are able to get you know good uniformity in terms of uh, you know when repeating the same measurements on the same device. Uh, here you can see the device to device uniformity. Now although the drop casting does not really result in a uniform uh, coating across the sample, however we are able to get uh, almost a uniform uh, you know uh, performance in terms of memory window. And the reason here can be explained uh, to the fact that there are more charge shopping states in the uh, MOS2 region than the number of charges that are trying to tunnel at a specific uh, program and erase voltage. <clears throat> uh, and here you can see the, uh, uh, the endurance of the memory device, which tells us for how many program and erase cycles uh, we can apply before uh, the, the device performance starts to degrade. Uh, and you can see that we have shown uh, up to 10 to the six uh, cycles with negligible degradation in the origin performance. And finally, we did a retention characteristic, which tells us for how long the data can be stored in the memory before you know uh, they, they start to leak. Uh, and you can see we did the retention at 100 degrees Celsius at elevated temperature uh, to do an accelerated stress test. And the extrapolation to 10 years show that we are still able to achieve a large memory window of 1.5 volts uh, you know, even after uh, 10 years. So, so far I have shown the, the uh, electrical performance. So now we move to the optical performance to, sh to show the ability to sense optical data, right? So in this case, we shown light uh, using laser onto the device uh, with, different, with different wavelengths. Uh, and you can see that the erased state uh, is uh, under dark conditions here. While when programming the device with different wavelengths of light, we can see different memory windows, different hysteresis, right? So this means that you are really able to di di differentiate between the, the different wavelengths of light within the same uh, device, right? The, the memory device. Uh, retention characteristic here also shows that we are able to re retain data 
uh, at elevated temperatures up to 10 years uh, with a large memory window. So this means that it's a non-volatile uh, performance. So we are really storing data in a non-volatile manner, as well as sensing this optical uh, data. Right? We are sensing the optical data and storing it directly within the same, the same device. Right? We also did some uh, endurance in terms of electrical erasing and optical programming up to 1,000 cycles. Of course, in this case, we didn't turn on and off the, 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 the laser, otherwise this will damage the, our laser. Uh, we have a shutter that we program and we place it in between the laser and our device. And so we, we open it and close it uh, up to 1,000 times. And uh, we, we show that we are still able to get you know, uh, a, a decent performance uh, up to 1,000 cycles. Uh, this graph here shows uh, that when we do pulses uh, of one uh, microsecond uh, pulses of a specific wavelength, specific intensity, uh, we are able also to change, uh, you know, the, the the memory window, and this can be useful for application in neuromorphic computing. Okay, so that was the first uh, demonstration of of in-memory optical sensing using the flash memory architecture. We also try to explore uh, the in-memory optical sensing using a different memory technology, which is the memristor, the memristor technology. Uh, uh, memristor technology, it has different, you know, within uh, under the memristor, uh, you know, technology, there are different, uh, you know, uh, uh, devices uh, with different mechanisms. One of them is the conductive bridge resistive RAM. It's a very simple device based on two electrodes with a, an insulator in between. You have to have one electrode which is uh, based on an active material that can get ionized under a specific applied electric field. Uh, and so these uh, ions of this metal, right, they can go through this, uh, uh, they can diffuse through the insulator and create a bridge in between the top and bottom electrodes and therefore moving from a high resistive state to a low resistive state. And therefore you can have a program that erases states. Now, to erase this memory, you have to apply a negative uh, voltage so that this bridge is ruptured, and therefore you go back to the high resistive state. Uh, now, one thing that I would like to mention here is that, uh, yeah, so one issue with this uh, kind of uh, memory devices, the memory there is usually it, it shows a large variability in terms of cycle to cycle uh, performance, because this bridge, uh, it really randomly gets created and ruptured. So sometimes it's, it's created here, sometimes it gets created there. Uh, in the erase, it gets ruptured here, sometimes it gets ruptured at another point. So you get a, a variability in terms of cycle to cycle uh, performance. So what we did here uh, is we explored uh, the memristor with, with two layers instead of a single layer with different uh, thermal conductivities, different properties of, in terms of thermal conductivity uh, and ionic transport properties. <clears throat> Uh, we, we explored black phosphorus in this case uh, as one of the active layers, which is uh, sensitive to light. Again, it has been used in uh, previously uh, in, in photo detectors that has shown also a, a very good performance. And so we wanted to explore the application here in our own um, in-memory optical sensing. And uh, we added hydrogen oxide using atomic layer deposition on top uh, to achieve uh, so two layers with different uh, thermal conductivities, and therefore. This will help in, in uh, uh, localizing the point where the bridge gets to, uh, you know, rupture, and therefore it helps us in confining and getting better cycle-to-cycle -cycle uniformity. So here you can see the cycle-to-cycle -cycle vari vari variability when having a single uh, layer of hafnium oxide. So you can see we really get a, a large variability from the first cycle to the 100th cycle, while by using the two layers we are really able to confine uh, and, and, and get better uh, variability up to 1,000 cycles. This is a TM image, TM cross-section, which shows that we have black phosphorus of around 40 nanometers. Again, they were drop casted in this case, so we are getting a, a large uh, thickness here. And this is the EDS profile, which again confirms the different materials that we have and their thicknesses. Uh, so to explain uh, briefly the switching mechanism, as I mentioned, when we have a single layer, the the uh, the, the way that the bridge uh, or the, the filament uh, gets to get created uh, is uh, a bit random. So we have a stochastic, uh, uh, you know, uh, formation of this uh, filament and the rupture as well, which causes this uh, cycle to cycle variability. While by using two layers with different thermal conductivities, we can really have a, an hourglass shaped filament 
where the weakest point is at the interface between the two materials. And therefore, we are really localizing and confining the point where the bridge gets to, uh, you know, get formed and uh, uh, ruptured at this point, which results in a, you know, better uh, cycle to cycle uniformity. So, so far I showed again the, the electrical performance. Now we move to the optical performance to show the in memory optical sensing. Uh, so in this case, again, we, we show light uh, onto the device. So when the light is turned on, you can see that there is a sharp increase in the current. While when we turn off the light, you see that the current starts to uh, gradually decrease, but it doesn't go back directly to the original uh, state, which means that we have some persistent photoconductivity. Now this gradual decay can be ruptured using a negative uh, voltage, which allows us to directly erase the memory and go back to the original state. So we really can do uh, optical programming and electrical erasing in this case. We also try to show some, uh, you know, uh, characterization, uh, which uh, which is uh, you know important for uh, a neuromorphic computing, where we try to mimic the the, the functionalities of of the synapses in the human brain. Uh, so one uh, important uh, characterization that we usually do is to give two pulses, consecutive pulses of different time intervals, uh, and check the output from the second pulse. Uh, of course, as the time interval is increased, the output from the second pulse gets reduced, as you can see here. We also th showed that we are able to move from short-term memory to long-term memory by uh, just playing with the intensity of the light or the, the duration of the pulse. Uh, of the optical pulse. So as you can see here, when we shine a uh, light with an intensity of 32 milliwatt per centimeter squared, uh, we, we are still in the short-term memory where uh, we get a small increase in the current, but then it goes back uh, to the, uh, you know, it starts to go back uh, to the original state. While by increasing the intensity, we can see that uh, we have a slower decay uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the current, which means that we are really moving to, a, to the long-term memory. Similarly, by playing with the pulse duration from two seconds up to five seconds, we can uh, also move from a short-term memory to the long-term uh, memory. And uh, the mechanism here is based on really providing trash shopping centers uh, for these photogenerated uh, carriers uh, to be you know, stored in a non-volatile manner. Uh, <clears throat> we were able also to, to mimic the learning for getting relearning process that the human, the human uh, you know, has. Uh, so we, we showed, uh, like when we uh, learn data and then forget it, and then we try to relearn it, we, we show how the uh, impact of the earlier learned, learned information uh, can boost the memory ability. So here, for example, you can see when turning on the light, uh, initially for the first five seconds, which mimics the learning process. And then when we turn off the light, we are now forgetting the, the data. And then when we turn again uh, the light, we can see an improvement in terms of the photosynaptic current, which shows the impact of the earlier learned uh, information in, in boosting the memory ability. Of course, we want to expand the application of these devices into you know, uh, different applications, such as uh, artificial retina and wearables. And so we want to flex them. And in this case, we did the flexing by back etching. So those devices are based on uh, silicon. They, they, they fabricate on a silicon uh, sample. And so we did back etching to uh, achieve a very thin thickness of less than uh, 50 micron, which allows for the flexibility of these devices. And of course, we you know, uh, characterized again those devices in terms of electrical performance and synaptic fe features to show that this uh, flexing mechanism does not uh, affect or degrade the, the electrical performance of the device. And another uh, more recent work, which is uh, still unpublished, and it's uh, in collaboration with Professor Dinesh Shetty from Khalifa University in the UAE, uh, where they fabricate and synthesize uh, green uh, cough uh, materials. And uh, so we, we try to embed those uh, coughs in, in uh, a memristor application again to show a green memristor. Uh, it, it also showed you know, excellent uh, uh, electrical performance in this case, and we showed the application in, in uh, you know, image recognition. Okay, so now uh, I can move to the second part uh, of my talk. Uh, so the first part was focused on memory devices and specific smart memory devices which can sense and compute. And now we move to the second part, which is focused on the 3D and 4D printing of uh, you know, uh, electronic devices. <clears throat> so. Uh, and this work, this uh, work that I will be explaining here, uh, is done by my master student, 
daughter of Khadir, who's from Saudi Arabia, and she's currently uh, doing her PhD with me. Uh, so in this project, we wanted to really overcome the limitations of existing ECG uh, patches. If anyone has done uh, ECG you know, measurement, you will know that the ECG patches are wet electrodes, the traditional ones. They require some kind of gel to be placed in between the patch and your uh, skin right, uh, to do the measurements. Uh, so this gel includes some toxic materials which can cause skin irritation. Also, this gel tends to dry uh, over extended durations and therefore it does not really adapt for long-term monitoring. Another issue with these traditional electrodes is that they use chemical adhesives to achieve adhesion to the skin. Uh, these chemical adhesives, uh, they are strong, they leave residues, they can cause skin irritation, and they are not really suitable with infants uh, as they can cause skin injuries in, in infants and neonates. Uh, so we really wanted to overcome this limitation and to come up with a new approach to allow the adhesion to the skin uh, without using any chemical adhesive. Uh, in addition, we don't want to use any uh, gel in between the skin uh, <clears throat> and the electrodes, so we wanted to focus on dry electrodes in this case. Uh, okay, uh, so in this case, what we did is we got inspired by the skin. Sorry. So we got inspired by the skin of the octopus, which includes those suction cups, right? Uh, which allows the adhesion to different surfaces, right? By applying a, a small, uh, uh, you know, pressure, uh, you can achieve adhesion to different surfaces using these suction cups. So we got inspired by, by this skin uh, and we included them, integrated them, we 3D printed them in our bio patch, which is based on PDMS. Uh, so we included those micro scale suction cups in our uh, bio patch, right? And then we also included some microfluidic channels to allow the sweat to get, you know, to, to get evaporated and, and so to make it more comfortable to the wearer, especially when worn over uh, long durations. Um, the, the electrode, the active layer of the electrode is based on silver silver chloride. Uh, again, it was also 3D printed using the direct ink writing uh, approach, as you can see in this video. So that it's a 3D printer uh, based on direct ink writing using a syringe you know, based uh, writing. Uh, we have this ink, which is based on silver silver chloride, uh, while the patch, bio patch, is also 3D printed uh, with those uh, grooves and suction cups based on PDMS. And in this video here, you can see uh, initially the, the suction cup uh, being uh, adhered, uh, you know, it's, it's now adhering to a, a glass uh, a substrate, right? So you can see that the groove, the suction cups, they're not very visible. But while we try to peel off the, 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 the bio patch, you can see that these suction cups start to pop up uh, and the air uh, starts to get introduced in these suction cups. And therefore, uh, we are really achieving adhesion using those uh, suction cups. Of course, we, we explored you know, the, the impact or the effect of the different dimensions of these suction cups and their arrangement on the adhesion force and this is a nice thing which allows us really to personalize these uh, bio patches. Um, it allows us to really play with the adhesion force based on the dimensions and arrangement of these, uh, you know, uh, miniature, miniaturized uh, suction cups. And so it can be useful for different applications or also for different uh, skins. For example, for uh, infants and uh, older people, we can have uh, a smaller adhesion force, while for other, you know, adults, we can have a stronger uh, adhesion force. And these are the micro grooves or the microfluidic channels that we have explored in order to make those uh, bi bio patches breathable. So to allow the sweat to uh, get evaporated over time and, and so to make them comfortable to the wearer, especially when worn over extended durations. We also explore different patterns of these uh, you know, microfluidic channels. Uh, now, now to explore the, the breathability effect, or, or, I mean, the, the effect of these different uh, channels on the breathability, we did a test where we had a DI water uh, mixed with a fluorescent powder. Uh, we placed this, uh, you know, uh, fluid under the patch with different uh, patterns. So this is the patch with no patterns at all. And this is using four legs serpentine, three legs serpentine, and piano curve patterns. And you can see that after 1.5 hours, there is almost negligible evaporation of the water, which means, you know, uh, limited uh, breathability of this patch while the four legs and three legs serpentine uh, show uh, enhanced you know, breathability, so the, the, the water gets evaporated after 1.5 hours, uh, while the piano curve shows less uh, uh, 
breathability, and the reason is because of this very dense pattern, uh, which also uh, you know uh, creates more uh, resistance for the air as it as it tries to go inside the inside the the, the patch. Uh, uh, we, we also try to check the uh, adhesion force of these uh, bio patches on the skin when we when we do different movements. And this video, you can see that the patch is really being adhering well to the skin, even when different movements are being performed. Uh, here, you can see the difference between a non-patterned patch and the patch with the suction cups, the octopus you know, suction cups. Uh, here, you can see visually <laughs> the, the ad adhesion force, right? Uh, we also try to attach a small weight, 300 uh, milligrams, uh, to the edge of the uh, patch to show that it's still adhering well to the skin. And when removing the patch, you can see that there are no uh, residuals left on the skin, as opposed to the case when you have uh, uh, patches with chemical adhesives, which can leave residuals and, and even skin irritation. We actually did a test for that as well. Uh, so we, we got different uh, commercially available uh, patches, okay, for ECG measurements. So these, they use different uh, chemical adhesives. Uh, we placed them for six hours on the skin uh, uh, of a, 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 you know, uh, a, a female student in this case. Uh, and, and here uh, we have our own patch. And you can see that after six hours, uh, you, you see the residues, right, from the different adhesives as well as the skin irritation, while our patch shows, uh, you know, limited or, or negligible, uh, you know, skin irritation or uh, any uh, residuals. Then we did some, you know, RGB uh, analysis of these pictures to show the redness, to analyze the redness of the skin. And you can see here that the PDMS base uh, patch, which is, uh, which is our patch, shows, you know, the lowest skin irritation compared to the other uh, patches. In collaboration with our uh, bioengineering program at KAUST, uh, they helped us in doing uh, cytotoxicity tests uh, where they place those bio patches in, uh, you know, with, with living cells, and then they check if the living cells, they die after some time or no. So this tells us about the cytotoxicity or the biocompatibility of these bio patches. And this test confirms that uh, our bio patches are biocompatible. Um, and here you can see also the conductivity of the uh, active layer, the, the electrode, the, the ink, uh, the, the silver silver chloride ink, uh, the conductivity and therefore the stability over, uh, you know, uh, 30 days uh, a month. So we are able to get, you know, a, a stable uh, performance of the, uh, you know, the, the electrical contact or electrode. And then uh, we attached our own uh, ECG electrodes, our uh, electrodes to a, a system which is uh, commercially available, the system. So this system, uh, it's really, uh, the, the role is just to collect the data from those patches that we uh, developed and to send them wirelessly through a phone uh, application, uh, through wireless uh, to a phone application. And in this video here, you can see, um, uh, so th this is the system with our own patches and this is the commercial patches. And then we connect them uh, uh, to the, you know, on the chest. Uh, of one person and we collect the data and you can see what, that you are able to really uh, detect the PQRST peaks, uh, you know, with, with uh, you know, very good, you know, uh, overlapping data. Uh, we're still currently exploring, uh, you know, improving the, the uh, or, or performing uh, additional testing under wet conditions, uh, which means uh, assuming that the skin is already wet and we want, we want to try now to check the, the adhesion uh, of these uh, patches on a wet uh, surface. Uh, we already did some tests, which I don't have uh, you know, pictures here, but we already did some tests where this patch, which is already attached on the skin, uh, and then we try to put the, I mean, move the, the, the hand down into the water. Uh, we, we show that we are still able to have good adhesion on the skin. We're doing now also clinical testing validation uh, with the help of the Kaus uh, Health Center. Uh, we're also trying to enhance the reusability of these electrodes using a UV-based uh, sterilization. Uh, so in, to compare our uh, 3D printed dry electrodes with the commercially available ones, we can see that our electrodes use non-reactive dry materials as compared to the wet electrodes which require some reactive gel. Uh, we don't need any skin preparation in our case. Uh, commercial electrodes usually, usually require shaving before using them. Um, it does not cause any skin irritation, as I have shown, 
the design can be personalized, which means really these suction cups can be uh, designed, like we can change the dimensions and the arrangement to change the adhesion force. And therefore we can really personalize the design. Uh, in terms of cost, we did a, a you know a, a, an estimation uh, uh, of, of the cost, like we did a breakdown of the, of the cost of our patch. We showed a 54% reduction in cost compared to the commercially available ones. Although the final cost will really depend on the uh the, the, the you know the market uh, uh and then we are trying to improve the multiple uh, use uh, performance uh, or ability of our uh, patches in a similar work also on ecg electrodes uh, which was performed by my uh, two interns uh, uh in, in this case we were really focusing more on stretchability for wearable applications <clears throat> uh, and so in this case, we used a fractal design, again, using 3D printing, uh, syringe-based printing or direct ink, ink printing. Uh, we use the same material and using these fractal designs, we can really achieve uh, a good stretchability. And, and you, as you can see in this picture, you can really compress those uh, you know, uh, electrodes and they will go back to their original state. Uh, again, we are able to you know, over, get overlapping data between our electrodes and the commercially fabricated ones. Okay, so, so this uh, uh, this was the part regarding the 3D printing of ECG electrodes. Now we'll move to another project where we focus on the 4D printing of actuators. And this is a project done by my uh, master student Fahad Al Murad, who is also currently, uh, you know, still in my in my group uh, as a PhD student. Uh, so anyone has heard of uh, 4D printing? So it's very similar to 3D printing, but using uh, materials that are smart, uh, which means you 3D print something, and then when you expose the structure to an external stimulus like light, uh, humidity, uh, different pH level, it changes the shape and you get a new, a new structure. And this is why it's called 4D printing. Uh, so you can think of 4D printing as really as if you are getting rid of a microprocessor and combining between the sensor and, and actuator in a single you know system. Uh, realizing uh, 4D printed actuators. Because in general, if you have a specific actuator that you would like to actuate, you need a sensor with it, right? Uh, to sense the external stimulus, you would need uh, a microcontroller to analyze this data and then to send to the actuator a specific decision, right? To, to make a specific movement. But in this case, since you are using smart materials, which directly sense the, the outer environment, and change shape, and therefore does do do the actuation directly when exposed to the uh, external stimulus. So it's really as if you are combining between sensor actuators and microprocessor in a single device. And the best thing is that does not require any power, right? Uh, so we try to show the application in solar trackers. Uh, so solar cells are usually attached, usually on top of uh, uh, you know solar trackers to allow the tracking of the sunlight. Since the the sun moves, you know, uh, throughout the day and throughout the year, um, traditional uh, solar trackers are mechanical systems which include uh, uh, motors, uh, microcontroller, uh, sensors, uh, you know, battery. Uh, so many uh, components, which is uh, a heavy system, requires maintenance, uh, expensive, and limits its application mainly to you know a uh, few applications. So in this case, uh, we wanted to use uh, the 4D printing uh, of smart legs to allow the solar cell to move and you know, uh, follow the sun, right? So we, we 3D printed those uh, materials which are based on a sh shape memory polymer. We, we intentionally use this uh, shape, uh, like uh, you know, circular rings on top of each other. And, and therefore, one, once exposed to light, uh, it would compress, the structure would compress allowing the tilting of the solar cell as you can see here so when when the these legs are exposed to the light from this side for example those legs will compress allowing the tilting of the solar cell and therefore following the sun tracking the sun and here in this uh, figure you can see the power output from a solar cell using our uh, you know 4d printed solar tracker and the solar cell the same solar cell but uh, without any solar tracker so in a stationary state and uh, when we tilt the the uh, the angle of the light, the incidence you know uh, angle of the light, you can see that from the uh, uh, flat traditional you know, solar cell with no tracker, you can see that the power output decreases by almost thirty percent 
when the tilt angle is around 30 degrees. While using our solar tracker, we, re we reduce that uh, degradation to 6% uh, because we are really tracking the sunlight, right? We are moving the, the solar cell and therefore tracking uh, this moving uh, sunlight. But now, th since there is still a 6% degradation, it means that the, we, there is still room for improvement in our uh, design as well. Okay, uh, so I think I still, do I have two yeah, minutes? Okay, okay. okay. Uh, so, so far I have covered the works that we have been working on in my group, right, uh, as an assistant professor in my, in my group, but I would like to mention that I, that I have worked on different projects, you know, different uh, futuristic electronics uh, applications during my postdoc as well. And here I would like to mention just one of them, uh, uh, which is a, a very interesting, uh, you know, project on uh, developing uh, ultra flexible and stretchable uh, solar cells. Uh, so, uh, in terms of solar cells, silicon-based solar cells really dominate the market. Uh, currently, more than 95% of the commercially available solar cells are based on silicon, uh, ba uh, silicon solar cells due, due to the uh, maturity of the manufacturing process, uh, good reliability, uh, good uh, you know, um, uh, efficiency, uh, non-toxicity, and the availability of the material. However, these solar cells, they are rigid, right? Silicon is rigid. Uh, and so to make them flexible and flexible, which would make them promising for you know, a wide range of applications such as solar powered cars, drones, wearables, you need flexibility and stretchability. And so to make uh, the, the silicon uh, flexible, what researchers have been working on is based on thinning down the material to achieve a very thin thickness of below 100 micron, which would achieve uh, some kind of flexibility. However, by thinning down the material, we, uh, we are reducing uh, the, the active material which absorbs that, and therefore this affects the efficiency of the solar cell. Also, <clears throat> by reducing the thickness, we are degrading the mechanical resilience because it becomes very difficult to handle those very thin and, and uh, you know flexible uh, silicon uh, solar cells. Uh, so we tried to overcome these limitations, and we came up with a new approach, uh, which allows us to transform uh, uh, commercially available large scale rigid solar cells, five inch by five inch, into their ultra flexible, but not only flexible, but also stretchable version with uh, limited you know, uh, degradation in the original performance. The fabrication process is very simple based on two steps. Again, we didn't fabricate the solar cell, we got it from uh, Sun Power, a company, so it's commercially available. It has a, 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 the contacts on the backside, integer by contacts on the backside, so no contacts on top. What we do is the first step is we coat the top surface with a photoresist to protect the solar cell and apply a Kapton uh, mask, which is next pattern using uh, a CO2 laser. And then the exposed areas would be completely etched using a deep reactive ion etching uh, tool. Uh, and therefore we get those islands, right? Islands of solar cells, which are readily interconnected using the back contacts. So the back contacts are already there. And by having different patterns, hexagonal, diamond, honeycomb, you can really play with the different flexing capabilities, different stretching capabilities, the weight, uh, the specific uh, auto power, uh, which can be, you know, uh, you can then tune those based on the application requirements. Uh, so using uh, this approach, we call it corrugation approach. You can see that this is this was originally rigid, a rigid solar cell, flat rigid. It became ultra flexible. We actually showed a world record flexibility. It can be bent down to 140 micron bending radius. It can be stretched. So here you can see the stretching of these solar cells. Uh, so in this case, we have on the backside an EcoFlex coating, uh, uh, which is an elastomer, while the, the, the uh, rigid islands are still there. And the, the stream is being absorbed by the elastomer while the, the, the rigid areas remain uh, intact. Here I would like to note that the thickness of the solar, the, the, the islands uh, is still the same. It's a thick thickness, right? Which uh, improves the mechanical resilience of these solar cells as compared to the approach where you just have to thin down. And not only stretching in plane, but also out of plane. You can do stretching out of plane, which can be important for you know different applications. Uh, also, uh, we showed an interesting application where we wrapped this uh, uh, you know, uh, corrugated solar cell to a spherical uh, shape, which allows the, the uh, the, the harvesting of the light from three dimensions, including the background reflected light. So the sun hits the floor, some light gets reflected, and because you have a spherical shape, 
this back reflected uh, light gets you know recycled and harvested uh, within this uh, spherical cell. Uh, this spherical shape also helps in, in dust management uh, because of the spherical shape, it allows you know the, the dust to fall down as opposed to a flat cell with the same projection area. Uh, also, it allows for an improved uh, thermal uh, you know dissipation because of the grooves and the the, the, the you know spherical shape and the grooves improves the you know increases the surface area to volume ratio and therefore enhances the thermal dissipation by natural convection. Uh, so using the spherical cell, we showed an enhancement of almost 100% in the power output compared to a flat cell, a traditional flat cell, with the same projection area. Uh, we also showed the application on, uh, on uh, drones. So again, you can see the flexibility. They can really take the shape of you know, different curved surfaces uh, and, and uh, you know, in, in collaboration with uh, a, a, a startup at Scouse called Falcon Viz, where they work on, on drones. We attached our own uh, flexible solar cells and showed the extension of the flight time of these drones using our own flexible uh, solar cells. Uh, with that, I would like to first thank uh, my team members, my students and postdocs who did most of the work that I presented today. And I would like to thank you all for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions.